Welcome to Microbial Myths. I have a question for everyone. How many of you have dropped some food on the floor and then picked it back up and eaten it? Yeah, or watched your toddler do it? All right. <laughs> so this is known as the five second rule and there is a lot of debate. Is it real or is it not? So we're gonna tackle that and other microbial myths in our session here. My name's Ada Hagen. I blog for uh, Microbial Sciences ASM blog and joining me is Dr. Michael Schmidt who will be helping answer our microbial myths today. So Michael, is the five second rule real? Five second rule is not real. Uh -oh. and, and, you know, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. The wetter the food, the greater the likelihood that that microbe that's resident, and it, there's a fancy term for it, it's called the built environment. And we all live in the built environment, and when you drop things onto the floor, the wetter they are, the greater the concentration of microbes that they will pick up. And you're sort of, and this was done really well in a paper that appeared in Applied in Environmental Microbiology by our colleagues from Rutgers University. The first author was Ransom. So I encourage you to go take a look at that paper, but we'll distill it down for you in brief. The things that they looked at are things like watermelon and gummy bears. So which one do you think would be more likely to pick up microbes. And they used a wide variety of surfaces. So which one of those two food items, they had a couple of other things in there, but we won't cloud you with facts. We'll make you go read the paper. Which one of those items, a gummy bear or the watermelon, do you think will pick up food, uh, pick up microbes more easily? Watermelon? You guys all pass. You must be microbiologists. <laughs> My medical students always get this one wrong. You know, they believe in the five second rule. They swear by the five second rule, which is probably why they're sick and they don't come to class. But <laughs> One of our next microbial myths is plastic cutting boards are more sanitary than wood cutting boards. So going back to home in the kitchen, should I use plastic or wood? Does it matter? It's uh, one of those complicated questions Okay. because we've all seen the plastic cutting board that's been used quite often. And what happens with the plastic cutting boards is they scar. And they scar as a consequence of the knife cutting the fruit, vegetable, meat, whatever you happen to be using. And where do you think the biofilm will establish itself? It's going to establish itself in that cut. And even if you run it through the dishwasher, it, that biofilm, especially if it's a spore former, can often withstand the washing and the suds and depending upon how dense that biofilm was before you threw that cutting board into the dishwasher can come up. Now the wood also can get scarred, but what are you supposed to do with wood cutting boards? You're supposed to oil them. Now what does the oil do to a wood cutting board? What do you guys think? What would oiling a wood cutting board do? It's gonna dewater it. It's effectively gonna deprive the microbe of its most important ingredient for any bacteriological media, and that's principally water. So the oil is effectively going to prevent or exclude water, and it effectively serves to lower the active water coefficient associated with that surface. So for many years, cutting boards were oiled with food-grade mineral oil to effectively protect them. But we know those nasty little things like salmonella and campylobacter and clostridia, also known as chicken, can come into play. And if any of you work for Purdue, please don't throw chicken parts at me. But, but you know what I'm speaking of. And how many in the room have had chicken gravy food poisoning? Well, if you were at an ASM meeting, and I was talking to my podcast co-host Elio Schechter last evening, 
And the first ASM meeting he could have gone to in 1953, the entire society came down with chicken gravy food poisoning as a consequence of the banquet dinner that they had at the general meeting. And so Elio was regaling that tale to me last evening, and I said, my goodness, to make an entire general meeting sick with chicken gravy food poisoning, and it came from our friend, good old Clostridium perfringens. So again, another myth busted. So, but ASM has a good 50-year track record for avoiding mass food poisoning? We stop feeding people. Oh. <laughs> That's why you're all scrounging for lunch. I mean, you can get gummy bears at the booth, but they've been hermetically sealed on Funkin' Wagnall's porch for decades, so, And if you, you know, drop them, leave them. Yeah. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but remember, you got to sanitize your hands, and there's plenty of those around the exhibit floor. Fortunately. So what I'm hearing you say about the cutting boards is wood, oil it, don't use soap, and recycle or get rid of the cutting board after it gets deeply scarred, get a new one, and that'll help avoid cross-contamination. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to move to sort of a different type of food item. Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes we watch these survival shows and people say that urine is sterile, and so you can drink it in dire circumstances. Is that true? Well, last year at This Week in, Micro, this week in Virology here at the general meeting, or Microbe, Vince Rack and Yellow got to interview one of the folks uh, from the space station. And what we learned from the space station is everything is recycled. But there it's a very, very fancy filter. And urine's not sterile because you can go to any number of sessions here at the, at the Microbe meeting and learn that we all have our own unique microbiome associated with our urinary tract system. And in fact, there was a session on UTIs over in one of the breakout sessions. And of course, we all have our unique microbiome and we're often shedding microbes. And if you leave urine sit around long enough, <laughs> it will become turbid. And the rule of thumb for UTIs is when you can see, when it becomes cloudy, it's tripped over that 100,000 microbial colon, mic, microbes per milliliter, and it begins to diffract light, so it becomes cloudy. And 100,000 is generally the break point at which you declare you have a urinary tract infection. So urine is not sterile, but on the space station, they run it through many, many filters, and they do indeed drink their own urine because water is a precious resource. Indeed. So what kind of bacteria do we have in our standard urine or bladder microbiota then? Well, you probably ate it for breakfast this morning. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the common microbes associated with yogurt, the lactobacilli. Okay. And maybe some actinomyces or staphylococcus. And you got everything. Yeah. It's, it's effectively skin, except on the inside. Okay. Remember, the human is actually a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> you know, we have this beautiful shell called icing, and that's our skin flora and the flora that coats our epithelial layer. And we all know that once you break that icing layer on a Krispy Kreme donut, it goes to pot. And so at the same time, we know that once we break the integrity of our skin and our epithelial layer, we sort of go to pot. <laughs> the microbes invade our sterile tissue and they, un, you know, they unleash the hellhounds and you know, an, in, an infection is the result and we get a really pussy event. That started as an appetizing metaphor. I don't think it ended that way. No, Krispy Kreme is always good to start, but it rarely finishes well. You, you generally eat the whole box, right? <laughs> I, I have never seen Krispy Kreme donuts bought on Sunday still there on Monday. All right. Um, let's move on to another myth. Um, All right. Or I guess you'll tell us if it's a myth or not. Can you get an STD from a toilet seat? Well... You know, that was something that terrified my mother as we were growing up. She was always terrified of public restrooms. And, 
you know, uh, as, a, as a graduate student, I, I had the father of the hepatitis B vaccine explain this to me. And it, we all know that hepatitis B is a very robust virus. So if you have a break in your skin and you happen to sit on a toilet that has a large concentration of hepatitis B and that break is actually sufficient, you can indeed. But for the garden variety things like HIV and Neisseria gonorrhea and syphilis, the answer, thankfully for my mother, is no. All right, I'll rest in peace then, yes. at least in the bathroom. All right, we're gonna stay in the bathroom and ask another question, talking about the bathroom at home this time. There um, is a myth or rumor that if you store your toothbrush in the open, in the bathroom, you flush the toilet, you go brush your teeth, you're brushing your teeth with fecal bacteria. Yep. Yes or no? That, that would be a yep. Yeah. That would be a yep. That would, well, I mean, think about it. Uh, fortunately for us, many of home toilets don't actually aerosolize to the level and extent of the toilets at meeting centers like these, hotels, or cruise ship lines. Did you ever wonder why a cruise ship gets so much norovirus? Next time you're on a cruise, flush the toilet and just watch the aerosol that comes out of that toilet. Many of you who've ever been on a cruise, on the last day of the cruise, it sort of smells like a swimming pool. Well, the cruise ships have learned that they hyperchlorinate the water that goes into the toilet. And so they hyperchlorinate the water so when you flush, it effectively is doing a decon of that area to help the cleaning staff turn over the room. So if I close the lid on the toilet at home, does that help reduce? It does help to yeah. produce. Remember, the solution to pollution is dilution. And by closing that lid, you do indeed dilute. Okay. All right. So you said that high flush toilets, like in the convention center that we have here, they aerosolize a lot. Well, they're under pressure. Under pressure. Like so, graduate students. Like, uh, that's true. I'll test that. Um, <laughs> so we get a lot of bacteria in the air then, potentially, especially if you have maybe a UTI or you've got that norovirus going through. Or diarrhea. Uh, yeah. Let's not forget that. Nope. <laughs> so... What about hand dryers? There was a viral post on Facebook not that long ago where someone took an auger dish, they put it under an a air hand dryer in the bathroom, grew all this bacteria and fungi, and used it to say that hand dryers are unsanitary. Is that true or false? Unfortunately, that is indeed true. And that paper came out in AEM this year and it's entitled Deposition of Bacteria and Bacterial Spores by Bathroom Hot Air Hand Dryers. Now, if you think about it, it makes perfect intuitive sense. I mean, we've all seen the dryers, they blow high volume of air, and if you happen to go into a high-end room, it's got one of those fancy Dysons. It even blows even more vigorously. And where does the air come from? It doesn't come from the outside, it comes from the same room that you're in. So the only reason you're using a hand dryer is because paper towels are likely not available and you've washed your hands, so they're wet. And so now what you're doing is you're bringing large volume of air, the air is warm and not sterile hot because you wouldn't put your hands under 220 degree air. And of course you can't pressurize the air like an autoclave. And so the net consequence is you're literally inoculating your hands. And this particular study equivalently showed that not so good. All right, fortunately we have paper towels in our restrooms here at this conference center. We do indeed. So I wonder if that was one of the contractual requirements. Hmm. What do you think? Are we that smart when we write our contracts? I think it's just the luck of the draw, and Georgia has lots of pine trees. <laughs> All right, we have one more in-depth question, and then we're going to go into a lightning round. A lightning round. All oh, right. no. So last big question, is there a best gut microbiome? We don't know. I, I think the data are still out there. I mean... 
every one of us would probably like the gut microbiome that would give us the six pack abs, right? I'm, I'm waiting for Dan and to come out with that product. Six pack abs be a great marketing tool. You know, just eat this pot of yogurt every day, you'll get six pack abs, no. And I think, you know, the studies here at this meeting are really beginning to go away from, and again, to steal one of Elio's lines, you know, much of the microbiome has been creating the equivalent of the New York telephone directory. If you've ever seen the telephone directory for the borough of Manhattan, you know it's about three feet tall, if any of you actually use telephone directories any longer. And who are you going to call? You don't know, unless you know someone in New York. And the issue is we are beginning to make those correlative studies associating good microbes with good phenotypes. And I think in the next five years, we are gonna to begin to discern what's actually going on. Right now, we know that stool transplants are the, for C. diff, work. And they principally work because the first thing that you do prior to the transplant is you nuke the normal flora that's still hanging around with the C. diff, and then you provide a flora that can establish itself, but it requires that nuclear event to effectively clean you out. And, and it truly does indeed work. I mean, there was that study in the New England Journal that effectively equivalently showed that. But if you've read um, on Small Things Considered, one of Stan Falco's post, he described how he did a stool transplant back in the 50s. So stool transplants, we all may think, are new, but they're really pretty old. And I encourage you, uh, in honor of Stanley's passing, to take a look at that blog post he, he wrote a few years ago because he was a bench-level technician when he effectively was making up stool capsules to send home with patients. And the net consequence is Dr. Falco got fired for making up the capsules. I mean, it's, it's a hoot. You'd go to jail today, but, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. So the jury's still out. Jury's still out. All right. But as, as we often say on TWIM, stay tuned. Stay tuned. All right. So now we're going to go into the lightning round. I'm oh, going to no. give you some questions. You get a yes, a no, and then one sentence. Oh, God. One but sentence. I, can, can, I can speak in very long run-on sentences. Let's not. <laughs> Let's not. Let's, all right. Spoken like my advisor. <laughs> okay, first question in the lightning round. Bacterial cells outnumber your own cells 10 to 1? No. Okay, you can get sick going outside in the winter, like if you have wet hair, aren't wearing a jacket, etc. You can always get sick. Okay. Yes. But is it caused by the winter? No. Okay. Um, you can catch the same cold twice? No. You, if you handle frogs, that will give you warts. No. Let's, let's expand on that one a minute. All right. We, we know what causes warts. It's human papillomavirus. And underscored the word human. All right. It's not frog papillomavirus. <laughs> okay. Uh, the flu shot can give you the flu. Uh, no. Should you wash your chicken or other raw meat before you cook it? That's complicated. The answer is no. <laughs> well, I know, but, um, and again, I'm going to go to the literature. In the United States, all chickens are dipped in bleach. So we're going to ask you guys, if you dip your chicken in bleach, will that inactivate microorganisms? Yes or no? How many think yes? How many think no? So, in a recent paper published in MBio, because the United States would like to sell bleach dipped chickens to Europe, Europe doesn't dip its chickens in bleach. Europe also doesn't refrigerate their chicken eggs. They're just on the counter in front of God and everyone. And so what Professor Bill Keevil from the University of Southampton equivocally demonstrated in his MBio paper is he showed that when you treat things like romaine lettuce 
and chickens, and you have the frank pathogens of Listeria monocytogenes, Salmonella. When you dip them into bleach, it causes the microbe to go into a viable but non-culturable state. And then he asked very elegantly, was the organism still alive? Now, to most microbiologists, the definition of life is able to form a colony. Bill's answer was, was it able to take out C. elegans? Because we know that C. elegans eats bacteria. And we know salmonella and uh, listeria are facultative intracellular parasites. They'll invade the, the C. elegans worm and kill it dead. That was more of a sentence, but I'm sorry. Okay. So let's distill that down a little bit. So some industries, they do wash chicken and romaine lettuce, apparently, but that doesn't actually help. The bacteria are still there. They're viable, so, but non-cultural. Okay. So when you are in your kitchen, do you run your bacteria, your chicken laden with bacteria under the water before you cook it? That's to get rid of the sand. That's to get rid of the sand. Okay. Yeah. So, but otherwise, no. We wouldn't otherwise, really do no. that. All right. Okay, two more lightning round Two more questions. lightning, I, I get it. All right. You can microwave your sponge and sanitize it. You could, but it won't be sanitized. Okay. Um, if your drink contains alcohol, you can share it safely with someone else without transferring bacteria or germs. All right. So you will all use, the answer is no, <laughs> because what's the active concentration of uh, alcohol ethanol in hand hygiene gels, 66%. How many proof is that? Double it. Have you ever drunk liquor at that proof and <laughs> talked about it the next day? <laughs> you forgot. Sorry, yeah, I went no, long again. No, that's a good one. So no is the short answer. No is the short that. answer. All right. So now we're going to move to our audience. Has anyone come up with a microbial myth that we haven't talked about yet? Uh-oh. Cranberry juice prevent UTI. Oh, cranberry juice and UTIs. The data argue no. However, there are some schools of thought that say maintaining a healthy you a healthy urine pH in the acidic range will encourage the lactobacilli rather than hinder them. And the lactobacilli will help prevent infection. Help and okay. in prevent the UTIs. Yeah. There was one back there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you, if you consume uh, probiotics like yogurt, will that influence your microbiome? There have not been a sufficient number of studies to equivocally say that for the general population. There are special cases with notobiotic animals in which we know it does indeed work, but for the general population, the data are still out there. Handling turtles, you can get salmonella? Yes. If you handle turtles, can you get salmonella? I don't know if everyone heard that. My answer was yes. Snakes too. If somebody sneezes next to you and you're not in a position to just walk away, say you're on... Uh, the train or the tube. Is there, is there anything you can do? Can you breathe through your nose or your mouth? Is one of those strategies preferable? Okay, so can you mitigate when somebody sneezes next to you? Mitigate the risk of getting sick? Your hope is that your immune system is awake. <laughs> and uh, short of eating a well-balanced diet and getting plenty of rest, and that is the best medicine to prevent the virus from coming in. Some viruses have lower MOIs, some have higher, and so it depends on the virus. Hi, I have a question. Um, is it possible for uh, women to treat a vaginal yeast infection with probiotics? Anything is possible, <laughs> but again, the, the definitive large cohort study is not yet been done to address that question. We get a lot of variability in what people are using. The FDA has been very good at establishing 
that the probiotics that we can buy in the United States do indeed have the numbers and types of bacteria that are represented on the label, but again, they're not regulated. So it, it, it's, um, it's hard because they're not ethical pharmaceuticals. So it's hard to know what the probiotic is because it's as yet an unregulated product. Is molecular diagnostic of microbes where we, uh, going to replace other cell culture, immunoassay, lateral flow, older technologies? So will molecular diagnostics for microbes and infections replace older types of diagnostics? Ten years ago, the answer to your question is yes. Ten years ago, if you asked and substituted the word molecular diagnostics for Malditoff, I would have scratched my head. But look at what Malditoff has done to the clinical microbiology lab. I think in the talks that we heard this morning in the uh, Center for the History of Microbiology, the influenza session, the last talk effectively highlighted the power of molecular diagnostics for discovering flu epidemics. I think uh, Sharon Peacock's talk at the opening session last night really framed it well. Pick a colony, sequence the colony, get it into the cloud, and know whether or not the microbe is antibiotic resistant. If you think about it, you get your antibiogram for free. You will then determine antibiotic stewardship from those data and the fact that it was integrated with the electronic health record, which has got artificial intelligence built into it, it will help us make better and more informed decisions. We know that more information helps us make better decisions, and molecular diagnostics help us make better decisions. But there's always a role for low tech. You brought the issue about the hot air dryer. However, if there is a bathroom without paper towel, what is best, the air hot, wire, the air hot air or wetting hands, the hands wet? Well, we started with the five second rule. And we know that watermelon picks up many bacteria. And so your hands are then soaking wet, and they're the equivalent, they got the active water coefficient of watermelon. And so as you're touching the door, I, I'm fortunate I wear pants, and, and, and that's what happens to my wet hands. Is it true that if we continue to use antibiotics the way we are using them now, we are going to fall to a complete uh, 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 bacteria with a complete uh, drug resistance? So uh, if we continue using antibiotics in the manner and at the pace that we're using them now, will we reach a point where almost all infection-causing bacteria are antibiotic resistant? It's a great question. The microbes gave us 100 years of oil. We've hit Hubbard's peak, and now the oil reserves are going down, but we have seen the rise of the electric car. We have seen the rise of the solar panels. We have seen the rise of wind. So humans have adapted. Similarly, the microbes gave us 100 years of antimicrobials. We started actively using the antimicrobials in 2050, uh, in 1950. <laughs> so I think we have until about 2050 to address that question. So I'm glad there's so many young people here because it's your job to find the new ones. And I think the answer is in probiotics. I think if we look at our normal flora and understand how to manipulate the community that is in an equivalent number to our human cells, we will begin to be able to still have active antimicrobials, but at the same time be able to put weight on animals so that we can continue to eat meat because most of the antimicrobials that are consumed on planet Earth are in the production of food for people. So we'll still have antimicrobials, they'll just look and act a little bit different. Yes. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you, Michael, for helping answer these microbial myths. Thank you guys for coming and sharing your questions with us. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of Microbe. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.